it's our pleasure to be joined today by our speaker, Dr. David Frischa, on the topic of innovations in foot surgery from ankle to toe. Uh, well, thank you, and thanks for attending in this uh, new Zoom world. Um, hopefully this will work out well. I think it has been. I've actually given I want to talk to 70 students at UC Riverside. So Zoom is, uh, you know, obviously, obviously entered our world for obvious reasons, but uh, hopefully with the vaccination, we'll all be healthier and doing well soon. Uh, in any case, the topic today is innovations in foot and ankle surgery from ankle to toe. And uh, there's several new things in, in foot and ankle surgery. Um, let's see, I'm trying to move forward there. There, okay. Yeah. Um, the... Um, and the two topics I'm going to concentrate on now are today are total ankle replacement and um, and uh, bunion surgery, which I think has there's been major innovations recently and and some of the most exciting things in my um, 30 years of over 30 years of practice here. And uh, just a brief review: the foot and ankle is uh, is uh, problems are common. Uh, you know, obviously we have both we all most of us have two feet and we uh, on them constantly, and almost everyone's had foot pain at some time in their lives. And foot and ankle problems are common. There's a foot, the foot's kind of complicated. There's 28 bones in the foot. You know, there's only three bones in the, there's only uh, three bones in the knee. There's multiple small joints. It's a complex anatomy. It's got a rich innervation and, uh, and it's a complicated thing. Uh, the innovations of foot and ankle surgery in recent years, total ankle replacement and bunion surgery, which I'll talk about. And I have a lot of slides on. I'm gonna try to go through it quickly so we have time for questions. The other things which we won't talk about directly today, but are ankle arthroscopy and soft tissue endoscopy, which has evolved over my career, posterior tibial tendon reconstruction uh, for the adult flat foot, which, um, you know, 30, 40 years ago, we just, if old people got flat feet, that was the way it was and you live with it. But now there's ways to fix that the painful adult flat foot. Um, fracture surgery, uh, uh, you know, sometimes these were career or, or, or job limiting injuries if someone fell and crushed their, their heel or foot. But with uh, fracture surgery, we're able to restore them to good function and uh, get people back to active, healthy life and, and, and work. And reconstructive foot surgery for, for um, arthritis and problems. There's been a lot of innovations in that. But again, today I'm gonna to concentrate on total ankle replacement and on, um, um, on bunion surgery. Um, arthritis of the ankle has really evolved over my career. Um, arthritis is uh, usually post-traumatic in nature. Uh, arthritis of the ankle is nowhere near as common as hip arthritis or knee arthritis. Um, it sometimes can be inflammatory from rheumatoid arthritis, but you know nowadays, fortunately with medications, uh, rheumatoid arthritis is much better controlled. Uh, arthritis of the ankle can develop from fractures or instability from chronic sprains. Uh, but again, the vast majority is from an old ankle injury, people that have have bad ankle sprains, people that break their ankle. And it, uh, and in stage ankle arthritis hits people earlier because generally sometimes people get these injuries when they're young from playing sports, football, um, um, hiking injuries, falls. And uh, so it affects them earlier. And then in the prime uh, of life, you uh, have a painful ankle, which limits your activity and walking. And so, uh, Ankle arthritis is a younger patient. It's post-traumatic, it's, uh, and the treatment can be challenging. Um, the initial treatment, like anything um, in, in foot and ankle surgery, is conservative. Uh, the uh, first step is to take an oral or topical anti-inflammatories, as in Voltaren gel, which is over-the-counter now, um, ibuprofen or Motrin, Advil, those type of things. Uh, corticosteroid injections, uh, sometimes going to give people temporary relief. It doesn't cure the problem, but can get people along for months with less pain. Uh, some people just have to adjust their modifications. Rather than running, they go to um, bicycling or swimming or other activities. Uh, braces or sleeves can help, but conservative treatment is the initial treatment before considering surgery. Um, after, when those fail, there are, these, there are several procedures that can help. Um, you know, one thing which sometimes helps is platelet-rich plasma injections, or some people do stem cell injections. Now that doesn't cure the arthritis or resurface the joint, but that can reduce inflammation that can help. Uh, the only problem with those is it's still currently not generally covered by insurance, so it's not inexpensive. Uh, sometimes the um, these other procedures like the arthroscopic debridement and distraction arthroplasty are kind of complicated things, but they just haven't been found to work that 
fell and the joint cannot be resurfaced. So really, um, up until recently, the gold standard was arthrodesis or fusion, which means removing what's left of the joint, putting the bones together and making it one joint. The only problem with that is it limits motion. Uh, you know, and, and um, that can be done either arthroscopically or open, uh, but it does leave a stiff joint. And the other option has been ankle arthroplasty or ankle replacement, which we'll uh, talk about in more detail, both those options. And uh, this is an x-ray showing an ankle fusion, which is, you know, you see plate and screws there fixing the ankle. So the, the arthritic surfaces are removed, the ankle joints put together, and those bone surfaces fuse together to form a solid joint. And that generally gets rid of the pain but it sometimes puts extra um, stress on other joints. And, and, all, and by definition, there's no movement of the ankle, which is you know, your primary movement in, in the hind foot. Uh, this x-ray is an example of an ankle replacement where you maintain motion and, um, and you see it looks a little more complicated in some ways, but the, uh, the, they've really evolved over the last um, uh, 15 years. Um, the, currently there's about maybe 25,000 ankle fusions a year, that's the, um, you know, that was the most common procedure for ankle arthritis. Uh, there's, um, you know, six to 8,000 ankle replacements a year and it's growing. Uh, I, and as you'll see, I think it's really become the gold standard because they become reliable. Uh, people are happy with them, they get good results and the complication rates fairly low. Uh, again, ankle replacement is nowhere near the volume of hip and knee replacements, there's over, uh, 800,000 hip and knee replacements done in the country per year versus about 6,000 uh, ankle replacements. Uh, but for those 6,000 people, it's a, it, it really can change their life. So um, ankle arthrodesis, the advantages of that is that it's, um, it, it, it provides function and pain relief. Um, if there's a significant deformity or there's other um, complicate or there's other potential morbid uh, complications like they you know need to have one surgery that solves it forever they have uh, uh, wound healing problems things like that it's probably the best option and it uh, does get rid of the pain but does leave a stiff ankle um, there is a certain non-union rate the patients have to be non-weight bearing for six weeks to three months afterwards to get the fusion to heal um, the, it by definition it's stiff so you do lose range of motion and that does put stress on other joints and uh, this is just an example showing with a fused ankle you know you still have some motion because these other joints these so-called uh, transtarsal joints in the foot still move but these joints are getting more pressure on them and that can lead to arthritis years later in those joints as they get more stress than they're used to um, again, the ankle fusion is durable. It's good for a lifetime. And if, and if someone says they just want, you know, they, they really want this to be the last operation ever, uh, that's probably the most sure thing, but it's, um, it, it also, you know, I think ankle replacement nowadays has some advantage, some advantages. Also people with, uh, infections and other severe deformities, other, and other problems are probably better for ankle fusion or, um, so, um, and, and again, the ankle, uh, ankle fusion, it, you, people can go on like here to develop arthritis of the subtalar joint or other joints. And uh, it's uh, thought that an ankle replacement will, uh, will help prevent that from allowing continued motion in the ankle. The, um, uh, most studies now show that ankle fusion and ankle replacement to both get good pain relief. Uh, with the prosthesis, it looks like we get better function. People get motion. People, you know, your mate, your joints are made to move, and uh, and uh, the the and with the good function and motion, people like that. Um, and uh, again, the satisfaction rate and the complication rates become gone way down over the years. Um, ankle replacement provides a less painful, stable. Um, um, uh, 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 less painful, stable foot. They have range of motion closer to the normal ankle. It may not, you know, it may not be a hundred percent of what a normal ankle goes, but uh, people vary. Some, you know, some have near complete motion, uh, but most have significant pain relief. There's a decreased risk of adjacent arthritis. Um, the disadvantages are it, like any joint replacement, like hip or knees also, you know, over 20, 30 years, it can wear out, but you can always replace this uh, this is modular, and this white piece is, is polyethylene, and that can be actually replaced with a new one, like a new tire, if it does wear out or, or wears you know, abnormally. 
Um, uh, sometimes uh, there can be loosenings, there could be infection, things like that. But fortunately, as the prosthesis and techniques have become better, there's much less of that. Uh, the history of ankle replacement is kind of interesting because it did start at about the same time of the other joint replacements. In the late 1960s, hip and knee replacement started and, and was a you know, life-saving thing for people that uh, had had this severe hip arthritis and knee pain and, and limited their function. Suddenly, they could do a lot more, and hip and knee replacements did very well. However, the ankle replacements initially did not do well. Uh, back then, routinely used bone cement and um, in, in, in replacements and it just failed. The ankle joint and bones are just small compared to other, um, compared to the hip and knee. And um, it had to be very precise and there's just too much stress. So they did not do well at all. The, um, the um, uh, however, um, the um, other options for ankle um, uh, replacement like the ankle fusion or if people have arthritis in multiple joints, Fusing the ankle and the hind foot is, is really makes people really stiff. So that's why to have an ankle replacement that can uh, keep motion is a good option, especially for those kind of patients. So um, over the years and in the um, over the last you know 15 to 20 years, the ankle replacements have really evolved and become reliable. Um, the the initial replacements did not uh, you know had some problems and loosening as in this one where it uh, it uh, the, it's not a good design prosthesis, and it did loosen and move. Um, so that so that wasn't a, a that wasn't a good option. But over time, they become much better. And these are some of the current models now. This is the um, what's called the in bone, and uh, and um, and uh, it, and this is the star ankle replacement uh, right here that um, have. Uh, you know, they have ingrowth, so they're usually not cemented. Um, if you can supplement it with cement, if the bone quality is poor, uh, but these newer prostheses have uh, much more better longevity and reliability, and uh, and uh, have really changed the the uh, the, uh, the picture. Uh, this was one of the early ankle replacements, uh, the agility, um, which uh, you know this uh, base they we, they finally figured out was too small and would erode into the talus. And uh, it initially had good sh shorter term results, but um, we learned it, it, it wasn't as long lasting. Um, and then later on, the star replacement had good results in Europe and uh, in the United States had good uh, studies that it was one of the first uh, widely ones to be approved widely in the United States and you know, about uh, 15 years ago. Um, and now they've evolved. Um, you know, I think this is uh, this uh, company has basically now three systems. This is the in bone with this modular stem, which can accommodate bone, which is osteoporotic or weak. Uh, they have this one, which takes away a little less bone for bone that's stronger or for younger patients. That has an ingrowth surface that grows into the bone, sacrifices less bone, le leaves a lot of good bone stock, and uh, the results from this have been very good. And then also there's components that are made for patients with worse deformity or what uh, deformities like this that fail or uh, for replacements like this, if they fail or there's loosening or a problem, there are revision components so that you can still keep part of the components in there and salvage it and, um, and, um, and uh, do a revision ankle if necessary, just like with the hip or knee replacements. And then this is an x-ray appearance of what the stem, the in-bone prosthesis uh, looks like. Um, and then, um, and uh, th those are both the components. There's no cement here that this it grows into the bone surfaces. And again, you've kept this joint uh, viable and, and working. And then the key again, is that you maintain motion of the ankle and um, that's the key to an ankle replacement. So the total ankle replacements, the designs are much improved. Uh, there's, um, you retain the range of motion and the design and devices have really evolved. Now with ankle replacements in, in the past, there were the, the only disadvantage was the complication rate was higher. That, you know, in ankle replacement routinely, you did an anterior uh, frontal incision in the, in the ankle. And um, the complication rate of that and healing rate was a little bit, was, uh, a little bit higher in terms of, of uh, developing uh, wounds and things like that uh, versus ankle fusions where 
or it was more of a side approach. You know, the, the, always the disadvantage with the ankle versus the hip or the knee is that, you know, in your ankle, you don't have a lot of muscle around there. You don't have a lot of fat tissue or subcutaneous tissue. So there's not much between the um, bone and, and the skin and, and the outer world. Um, so, but I think now with better techniques, with better instrumentation, we have less um, um, damage to the um, wound surfaces. And the comp I think the wound complication rate is way down and, and that's no longer, I think, a big difference. So we, again, as the instruments and techniques have evolved, we really made progress. Um, and again, as I've said, this is what, you know, this is why this is one of the more exciting things that I've seen evolve over the, my career. Because again, when I started practice here, we, we, there were no anchor replacements being done because there were not good ones out there. And then now it's uh, one of the more most uh, satisfying and reliable procedures. And um, and as this slide shows, I mean, the total ankle, you're just replacing the bony um, surfaces. The ligaments are still intact on the sides and that's retaining the ankle congruity. Sometimes you have to lengthen or release ligaments if there's a significant deformity, uh, but just like here, you've replaced the arthritic bony surfaces with the metal and plastic components. And um, the, um, Again, the instrumentation, uh, these comes in multiple large trays of equipment. It, it's, it's kind of a lot, if you like tools and toys, it's a lot of stuff to go through, but it makes it reliable and reproducible. So this is just an, an example of uh, the x-rays of a procedure being done. Uh, this is a, this the trial component that you do during surgery, the plastic insert. And then this is just an x-ray showing the um, uh, replacement. The, the, this clear part here is the plastic part. That doesn't is obviously less dense on X-ray. Uh, this is just some examples of cases. This is just a patient with significant ankle arthritis. You can see the foot's pretty crooked. A lot of people with ankle arthritis do have deformity of the foot's either um, you know turns in or turns out, and the ankle's worn um, you know uh, uh, you know more on one side than the other. So it's kind of complicated to realign, but we can realign it straight. So like, as in this case shows, you know, remove the arthritic surfaces and then replace it with these components. And that realigns the joint and gives you a moving joint that's not painful. Um, you don't lose any height and, or anything like that. Um, this is just a, a example of a continuum of ankle replacements. Uh, uh, this is uh, early on, you know, 15 years ago, uh, this uh, large device was used to help position it and align it. Uh, now, We've uh, gotten away from that a little bit because we're able to do preoperative navigation uh, with a CT scan and get custom cutting guides to get that alignment without using this big jig to align it. Uh, this was the end bone uh, prosthesis early on, and then um, this has evolved and improved. And again, this is the infinity, which takes less bone. Uh, the, the end bone and the also the envision, the revision one, have this long stem, which allows for uh, more stability and people with poor bone quality. And, and, and it's, the stem's modular, so you can make it of any length. And so that's kind of, uh, you know, again, there's a lot of versatility and a lot of good equipment now to uh, accomplish this. Uh, this picture here shows the um, uh, Prophecy cutting guides. And these are 3D printed sterile cutting guides that are made to fit on your bone based on your CT scan. So you get a CT scan of your bone and these cutting guides fit on your bone exactly and make uh, allow us to make the precise cuts to remove the exact amount of bone and uh, put the prosthesis in in the, cor in the uh, correct alignment. And this is just a, a slide showing the infinity ankle replacement. Uh, again, the bone ingrowth surfaces, uh, this is now um, uh, uh, 3D printed a uh, metal piece that uh, so the bone is grows into this and uh, and uh, more reliably and uh, this is the uh, 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 Taylor component the, on the, the point below that grows in and the plastic uh, modular piece that fits in there. So again, one of the more recent prosthesis and there's several other companies now are, are make similar ones that uh, uh, that uh, have this kind of basic design. So it's a sign that we've kind of now come to a a good design that other companies are kind of making things similar and trying to improve them even more. Uh, but there's, there's several good designs out there. Again, this, this Infinity is a low profile design. Uh, we've been part of a multi-center study here at 
Eisenhower over the last several years. That's going to go on for 10 years. So we'll have good long-term data from multiple centers showing the reliability of this uh, prosthesis. Um, and then again, the interesting thing was these 3D printed custom cutting guides um, that, we, that we get, which uh, adds for reliable cuts. And uh, what we get is this report here. Uh, it's based on a CT scan that is sent to the company. And from that, they make these custom cutting guides that are made exactly for the patient's uh, bone and match exactly to the patient's bone. And so you have a sense of what size you, you, you uh, prosthesis you'll put in. And these allow you to make the uh, uh, perfect uh, cuts. Um, so this is uh, so this is the model that they send you of the person's bone that should match the bone here. This is the patient's bone here, the real bone, and this is the model of the bone, and then this is the cutting guide in front that fits right on their bone. And it's it's been shown they've studied it. It's very accurate um, to to you know to within. Uh, uh, a, a degree or two and 1.4 millimeters. It's more accurate than the instruments we have. And you can see how, how these components kind of fit on the bone here. And again, this is the uh, uh, plan that's uh, sent to the physician uh, showing the plan and how the, the cutting blocks will fit and uh, how best to plan for the surgery and do it most precisely. And uh, you know this is how, how what you do interoperatively with the cutting blocks, and this is how the prosthesis eventually looks. So it's kind of a nice way to plan for the surgery and make it as precise as possible. And again, this um, picture just shows uh, how the uh, 3D printed guides fit on the bone, uh, the pins go in, and that from that you're able to put a cutting guide on and make the precise cuts. So that's been uh, kind of exciting. And again, it's been shown to be accurate and reproducible in sizing and alignment. And so again, this is a continuum of ankle replacements now that you can have a lot of versatility for to, to, to um, um, correct a lot of deformities and the full continuum from, uh, um, of, uh, of uh, prostheses for uh, the initial surgery or for revisions if necessary. And again, ankle replacements have really evolved. There's a learning curve to it, but I think they've become very good. And, uh, and uh, you know, we're doing lots of them now. Um, the, um, uh, you know, we're able to do them sometimes on, on younger people if necessary. Obviously they may wear with time, but the results have been good now. And uh, we can accommodate for poor bone quality and significant deformities. But, uh, and again, the results have, uh, have uh, improved greatly and I think it's been a good a, been a, one of the best advances in the last uh, 20 years and again the maintaining motion is what we're about in orthopedics and decreasing pain so if you patients get rid of their pain and they have motion they're very happy and and again it's um, it's always satisfying when people come back you know, almost uh, you know just sometimes you know a few weeks after the surgery they're so much better and so happy that's the satisfaction of joint replacement and also the hope is that the other joints are, are, sal are maintained so you don't get arthritis in other joints and don't have to need other surgeries in the future for pain in other parts of the foot. So again, it's a complex procedure and uh, the uh, complication rates way down. Patients do walk better with it. And I think the results are very good. And so that's been exciting. And uh, the, new, the new systems have good predictable results. The uh, Custom cutting guides, I think, are very uh, helpful and make the procedure faster and more reliable. And um, the, um, the uh, patient selection is critical. Uh, the complication rates way down. And the procedure has evolved greatly. So that's a quick overview of uh, ankle um, uh, replacement. And the next topic I'm going to go on to quickly is bunion surgery. Um, and uh, you know, bunions a, a, a whole different subject. Subject, and it's kind of one of those things that, bun, you know, in the, I never thought that in my career we'd really come to a procedure that is so reliable and satisfying that it's, uh, it's, um, you know, become one of my favorite procedures now. But um, bunions are common. Uh, you know, up to twenty-three percent of people may have bunions. They, they can be progressive over time. It's more common in women, perhaps due to shoe wear. Sometimes her, due to her, you know, heredity and your parents. Um, 
Uh, but as people get older, we tend to get bunions. Uh, there's some adolescents that get bunions, which is obviously hereditary, but um, it's um, in the desert, it may be a little less common because people aren't wearing high heels as much, but still bunions are very common. They're frequently bilateral. Um, and the main indication for any surgery on bunions is pain. Now, there's a, a lot of different procedures for bunions, which indicates that there's no one procedure that works well. And I'm sure you've heard of most, a lot of people caution people against getting foot surgery or bunion surgery. And, uh, and uh, part of that is that there's been in the past a high rate of recurrence and a high rate of patient dissatisfaction. Uh, you know, the, as I've said, the foot and ankle is complicated. You know, the bunions are tricky because there's all the muscles insert on the metatarsal head, not the toe. It's a complex balancing problem. And I think as I'll show now, I think in the past, it, we just thought of it wrong and did not correct the real source of the bunion. And uh, so that's why this newer procedure, which uh, this uh, technique has kind of been around for a long time, but I think recently with some newer, newer experience and also newer devices, we're able to make it reproducible and really approach this problem that the bunion is a, is, is a, rotational and a, you know, and it's in, it's in three dimensions. It's not just a one-dimensional uh, deformity. So, um, uh, so as this slide shows, you know, bunion is, the, is considered the bump along here. This is a depiction of a straight foot. Uh, and, um, the, and, and, the, and the problem is the root of the problem is here at the base of the metatarsal, this first cuneiform metatarsal joint, which doesn't move much you know, a degree or two at the most versus your big toe joint moves, you know, 90 degrees or more normally. So um, in, in the past, um, so, so in, in the past, we just uh, approached the big toe joint and then approach the real source of the problem. Now the symptoms of bunions are pain, swelling, pain with shoe wear, pressure, crowding in shoes. Um, again, there's a genetic predisposition. Uh, there's a biomechanical imbalance. You can see here's a bunion. All the muscles insert here on the metatarsal, I mean, insert here on the toe, not the metatarsal head. So with just uh, subtle uh, changes in forces, you can, this toe can be pulled off to one side and you develop this bump in the bunion, which can become painful and rubbing your shoes and things like that. Um, obviously shoes like this can accelerate it. And uh, over time, you can develop arthritis, you can develop dislocation of the second and third toe, hammer toes, uh, pain in the ball of the foot, uh, lots of secondary problems uh, with severe bunions. Um, uh, conservative treatment doesn't work real well. I mean, the best conservative treatment is wide shoes, comfortable shoes, but spacers and pads don't provide a lot of relief. Uh, mainly wide shoes can help, um, but uh, um, once that fails, sometimes once that fails, then surgery is necessary. Now, the misconception is that, okay, the bunion is just a big bump here, and all we need to do is shave that off, and then we'll be fine. Uh, but uh, that's not the solution because, uh, you, you know, this bump did not, this is not a bump that grew here. It's because of the instability at this joint. And I think in, in the past, it, that wasn't always addressed correctly. And so, and so, like I said, it's instability at, at the base joint, not at the metatarsal head. So, in the um, so this these X-rays, this shows a normal foot with the uh, bone aligned, and this shows an arthritic foot. These two little dots here, which um, you know everyone asked about, these aren't just little things float, floating there. These are what are called the sesamoid bones, and these are two bones that are in the uh, flexor tendon to the toe. Uh, kind of like your kneecap is a bone that's in uh, that that's in the muscle in your extensor tendon to the you know to the leg, so these are so these bones should line up with the toe, but over time the the flexor tendon you can see is pulling the toe to the side, and that's why they're not aligned. And and so again, that's what the that that's the good example of a bunion. Uh, this X-ray shows you know bilateral bunions. You can see how wide these feet are and, and, and the deformity of both these feet. And then this, um, and, and like this slide shows a, a cartoon of a, the instability of it as the toe pulls over, the, this is the, it's unstable at the foundation of the joint here. And so the muscles pull it this way and accentuate the bunion. So the source of the instability is at the base, not at the, at the joint. And then sometimes that elevates the toe and puts more pressure on the bottom. 
Um, you know, you know, also as it moves, it rotates, so that wears the joint eccentrically and gives pain. And um, in the in the years past, we it was thought we thought of it wrong. And in you know what we do to correct it is saying, okay, we have this bump here, so we'll shave off the bump and we'll move the bone over, and that'll solve the problem. So, like in this slide, you can do that, and it initially it looks good, and the bump's gone, but this joint's still unstable. So the toe keeps on moving and falling off and it recurs. And so that's been part of the reason is recurrence rate and a dissatisfaction rate because you're, this is the problem at the base. You shave it off here, but the, that does not solve the source of the problem. And, uh, and, and again, you, could, you can cut off the bump and shift it, but it's still unstable here. So things can recur. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sorry. And anyway, this x-ray shows that the, um, that now you've made, a, this bone is a straight bone. Now you've made it crooked because you cut it here. So it's a crooked bone and this is still unstable. So it keeps on moving and the bunion deformity can recur. So, so this is an example of, um, actually, let's see if I can go back one there. Um, yeah, so, so initially it looks okay on the outside, but it's still crooked on the inside and, and, and it can recur. And so this is the, um, the, so this has kind of been the answer and this procedure actually has been around for a long time, fusing this first cuneiform metatarsal joint. But in the past it was, not the easiest procedure to do. When we did it, it would shorten the bone a lot and it wasn't very precise. And so people had different levels of success with it. But I think now with new equipment and techniques, it's become reliable and better and I think very satisfying. Um, so uh, as you can see with a severe bunion, like we over there, we correct it at this level and then that uh, realigns the toe here. You, nothing to shave off here as you rotate the toe and bring it over, that corrects it with a fusion at this base of this metatarsal bone. And again, the key is that there's some precise uh, devices that help you align it and cutting guides that help you uh, um, align it. So you make precise cuts and then these two titanium plates stabilize that joint, your body fuses that and then it's your, your, your foot's now stabilized. Um, and so again, this is an example of the traditional way where you just cut and shifted it over, but you still have a pretty crooked bone here versus this, which is realign the bone here. The set, you can see the sesamoid bone should line up with the toe. Here, they're still off because you haven't really realigned the source of the problem. And this may recur over years as the forces are abnormal. Um, so that's been the reliability and satisfaction of this uh, procedure. Um, that you're uh, approaching the source of the problem, this joint, not, you know, again, you haven't corrected it here and it will recur because this joint is still unstable. And the key to this too is the thought, the feeling that we're, uh, you know, I think in the past we, we, we were hesitant to do this because it's kind of like, well, why do we fuse a joint that's not arthritic, you know? You know and, uh, but the point is that this joint is, doesn't move very much. So versus the big toe joint is the most motion in your foot. So you're, and if, if you don't correct it right, you, eventually the big toe joint will have arthritis. So you're sacrificing a unstable joint, which doesn't move much for your, for this joint, which moves a lot. And if you can maintain that joint, you have much better function and, and uh, activity level. So the procedure too, with those two plates, it's very stable. Um, initially, you're not in a cast, generally in a soft dressing and, and uh, in a walking boot almost immediately. You can be partial weight bearing the first week and then full weight bearing after that in a boot. And so patients wear a boot for four to six weeks afterwards and the normal shoes at about six weeks. Um, and again, the satisfaction rate's been uh, very good. The uh, 
you know, it's a couple of little incisions. Um, the, um, the, uh, and, and again, I think these uh, patients, it, it's not a trivial surgery, uh, uh, but people seem to be very satisfied with it. And again, the biggest um, indication of that is that I have a lot of, most of the patients who have it on both sides come back and want the other side done almost as soon as they're able to because they're so happy with the first side. So it's been one of those satisfying procedures where it's reliable and, and uh, people get good pain relief and, and, and function. And again, this is just a, another photograph showing a preoperative x-ray where the patient has a large bunion, very uh, uh, you know, wide foot. And um, with this procedure, the, the foot's narrowed. So uh, you, know, you don't have such a wide foot, you fit in the shoes better, and the deformity is corrected at the level of the deformity without damaging the uh, joint that moves the most. So uh, th again, this procedure has been popularized now and I think is reliable because you have good equipment. I won't go to the details, but you have good equipment that corrects the deformity intraoperatively. You release some of the tissues around that joint. You, you correct the deformity. You have a cutting guide that precisely removes uh, the cartilage, but as little bone as possible so you don't get much shortening. And then you have multiplanar correction with these two plates that provide good correction and stability. And this is just kind of an interoperative uh, uh, x-ray showing the compression device that holds the correction. Well, you have this device that helps align your cutting guide. And then, uh, and then this is the cutting guide that removes the precise amount, precise amount of bone. And then you uh, can put the plate on reliably that so you get the correct rotation and correct correction. So you can see here, uh, an x-ray showing the plates on there um, uh, that's correct to the bunion. Uh, these again are the two titanium plates that to push the bone together. So your body fuses that in, into a good alignment and a good correction. So again, the key to this procedure, a first cuneiform metatarsal arthrodesis uh, called the lapidus procedure in the past after a doctor that first described it actually many years ago, but it, was, it hasn't been really popularized until the last few years as these studies have shown how reliable it is and as uh, this new better equipment's been done, been, been, been marketed. So it fixes the root cause of the problem. It corrects the bunion in all three planes. Patients can walk, put some weight in it almost immediately and the, the healing rates have been very good. And it hopefully permanently corrects the bunion and I think is much more reliable than the other procedures. So again, those are kind of the two most exciting things I've seen in my uh, career in foot and ankle surgery. And I enjoy doing those. And um, I'm uh, ready to answer any questions about these topics or any other topics in foot and ankle surgery.